again. As I said earlier, we are going to continue our series today in Heroes of the Faith. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Judges chapter 4. So as you saw last week, and hopefully you see this week again, you will notice that the heroes in these stories, these events, are not the people but the God whom they serve. So when we say heroes of faith, what that means is these people lived their lives in such a way and obeyed to the point where we can see God's faithfulness shining through who they were because of what he did through them. The, the people are never the main characters in the Bible. The Bible tells us many people whom God used to do his work. And these people and these events show us that God is worthy to be worshipped. And he is faithful. He can be trusted. So when we read about David and Goliath, for example, our, th- the how we read that, what we take from that is not supposed to be, oh, we need to go defeat the giants in our lives. No, it's we are unable. And so God sends somebody else to stand in our place. That's what he did with the Israelites, and that's what he, did, that's what he does throughout the book of Judges. Today we're going to talk about Deborah. Deborah is found in Judges chapter 4 and 5, and like last week, we are not going to look at every verse. Again, this does not mean that some verses are more important than others. But we're going to look at specific themes. We're going to look at at specific instances. Remember that all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. That's what Paul tells us. However, in studying a specific passage or a theme, sometimes we jump around a little bit to get the bigger picture or theme. So we're, we're looking at the 30,000 foot view rather than getting down into the details for this specific passage. So Judges chapter 3, because we have to set the stage, right? Judges chapter 3 is about Ehud, and, and he is one of my favorite prophets because, like most great people, he is left-handed. And so I connect with him in that way because the, the great ones are left-handed. Um, but r- really, Israel was doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Israel was not following God. And so God sent the Lord, strengthened the king of Moab. So every time you see, by the way, every time you see the word Lord in all capitals, that's Yahweh, that is the covenant name of God. So if you see the Bible say Lord, capital L-O-R-D, it is specifically referring to the covenantal God, the God of the covenant. He's identifying himself as the God of their covenant. So God, the Lord, raised up the king of Moab against Israel, and they oppressed Israel for 18 years. Then Israel repented. They called out to God. They cried out to God, and they repented of turning away from him. And so God sent Ehud to lead Israel, and he killed the king of Moab, which is an absolutely fascinating story if you want to read that. Not right now, though. Uh, but, but God sends Ehud, and he kills the king of Moab. And Israel had peace. And this sets up chapter 4. Because Israel is living in peace. God had, had sent Ehud to get rid of the enemies, the oppressors of Israel. And so Israel lived in peace. And then chapter 4 begins. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. They did again evil. Again evil. The word is again, the word again is a theme throughout the book of Judges. There is a cycle that happens 
all over and over again. Their faith ebbed and flowed depending on their leaders and their comfort. When they were comfortable, they, they relied on themselves. They turned away from God. And then God sent an enemy, God sent an oppressor to oppress them, to bring them back to a place of repentance. And it was a circle that was going over and over and over again. When they were oppressed, they repented. God would send a leader to lead them. Then they would defeat their enemies. Israel would have peace. They would rebel against God. God would send an enemy to oppress them. And this was a cycle that went on and on because the faith of the Israelites was not personal. The faith of the Israelites was never of the heart. It was about their comfort. So they were tossed to and fro by the cultural waves. It's important to note that during this time, when a people group conquered another people group, it was assumed that the God of the conqueror was greater than the God of the conquered. So when the Moabites came and they oppressed Israel, it was, it was as if, in their minds, the God of Moab was greater than the God Yahweh. So every time Israel was oppressed, Yahweh's name was defamed. The conqueror's God was praised. And so the surrounding nations, those whom Israel was created to be an example of and point people to Yahweh, were actually pointing people away from Yahweh because of the way that they lived their lives. Because of their disobedience, God's glory was being denied by Israel and they were allowing, they were perpetuating the idea that these pagan gods should be praised. Their disobedience was not affecting only themselves, but it created a situation in which the surrounding nations were not able to see Yahweh. So know this. In many ways, you are the only Jesus that people will see. People know that you are a follower of Christ, and you, are, you may be the only one whom they know. And you are pointing people to a God in the way that you live. Are you pointing people to the true God? Are you pointing people to Yahweh, to Jesus, by how you live your life, by what you say, by what you do, by how you trust and how you believe? Or are you denying him with your lifestyle and your words, your actions, your fears, or, or whatever could be preventing those around you from seeing who Jesus really is? This is what Israel was doing, and it had dire consequences on them and the surrounding nations. I remember, and I've shared this story before, but I remember when I was a prosecutor and um, it struck me after I left the Summit County Prosecutor's Office because people told me, we're going to miss you. And I guarantee you it was not because of my love. I guarantee you it was not because I was pointing them to Jesus. In fact, I was pointing them away from Jesus. I was the only Jesus that many of them knew. And they knew me for my sarcasm. They knew me for my wit. They knew me for my nicknames that I had for many people. They knew me for all kinds of things, and none of them pointed them to Jesus. And I remember when I left, and I, when it hit me, and I was heartbroken. Because in the moment, man, this is fun, in the moment, but looking back, I prayed and prayed and prayed that God would send me back to undo the damage that I did. And over and over again, the answer was a very loud no. And I, I had, at that moment, uh, resolved to not be that again. And let me tell you, then, when I went to the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office, it was hard to stay with my resolve. I am not able to live the faith that God has, has given me. I am not able on my own strength to be the salt and light to the world that I should be. 
in my own strength, I will always revert to the sinful creature that I am. I desperately need God's goodness and God's grace and God's power. That's why we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Because if we're not, we will always revert to the sinful people that we are. And that's exactly what Israel did. And so this sets the stage for Judges chapter 4 and the rise of Deborah. Chapter 5 is the song of Deborah and Barak. And we we will refer to that every now and then because that actually gives us some detail that chapter 4 doesn't give us. Chapter 4 is really a 30,000 foot view of what's going on. And chapter 5 is poetry. And so it, it, it has poetic license, but it still gives us some of the, de- the details. And the key to understanding what happened is found in Judges 5.31. So if you have your Bibles, if you have underlined do whatever to Judges 5.31 because this sets what exactly is going on. And this is the prayer. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. But your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. This is the prayer. This is what's going on. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. And it says, the ESV says, but your friends, but the, the meaning is that if, of that is those who love you. May those who love you be like the sun as he rises in his might. Not because of who they are, not because of what they do, but because of who Jesus is and what he has done in them. The defeat of God's enemies is God's work. Hear that and understand that. It is not Israel's work. It is not your work. Your job is is not to defeat God's enemies. That's God's job, to defeat God's enemies. Your job is to be obedient in what he has called you to do and what he has called you to be. God, hear this, God will not allow his people to continue to dishonor him. And this is why he constantly sent the, the oppressors to oppress Israel. Because they were dishonoring him by the way they lived their life. They went and they lived in their own way. And they did things that were contrary to God's law. And they did things that they were not supposed to be doing. And that is actually dishonoring God and his name. And he will not allow that to continue to happen. And so he sends oppressors. He, he will, he will deny his glory to those who claim his, his name and yet continue to deny him by the way they live their lives. He is glorified when we live our life as we should. He is glorified when we live as people who are children of faith. And the way, like hear this, because the way that God blessed Israel in the Old Testament is very different than the way he blesses his people in the New Testament. The Old Testament was very much about land, wealth, peace, and prosperity. He promised them a physical land. He promised them physical wealth. And the the point of that was because that's what the other nations would be drawn to and they would see, and then God's name would be glorified and spread throughout the earth. As we see the queen of Sheba with with Solomon coming up to see who this God is. That's what was, that was the purpose. And so they were promised land, wealth, prosperity. They were a nation that was created by God to show the surrounding nations who God is and what the people of God should be. And when they didn't, when Israel didn't, God sent their enemies to punish them and turn his people to repentance. This is different today. God does not promise you physical blessing. God does not promise you health and wealth and prosperity. God does not provide or promise, God does not promise success in this life. Much in the same way he doesn't promise difficulties because of your action. He promises you difficulties because we live in a fallen, sinful world. So the question, why is this happening to me? The answer is because you live in a fallen, sinful world and you need a Savior. That's, 
the simple answer. The issue, though, isn't that people aren't blessed in this life. We, we are, but the blessings that God promises us are not temporal. The blessings that God promises us are eternal. The blessing of God is that we get to experience God. We get to experience a relationship with him. We know him. We are known by him, and we receive eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the promised blessing that God promises us. And the, the way that he promises us things, they are not affected by inflation. They are not infect, affected by rust, by moth, by thieves, by anything in this world. They are eternal promises. They cannot be stolen. And we have to remember this if we're going to understand how God blesses his people. See, too many times people run to the prosperity gospel because it sounds so nice. Health, God give me health. If you say, man, I, if, I have seen on Facebook, which I really need to get off of, but I have seen on Facebook too many times, I am claiming health in God's name. Amen, amen, amen. Like that is one of the most ridiculous, unbiblical things that you as a follower of Jesus could claim. That is nowhere promised in Scripture. The problem with the prosperity gospel is not that it promises too much, but it promises too little. And it, it creates this idea that people think that if they follow Jesus, their lives will be happy. And therefore, when they live their lives and they're not happy, something's wrong. God must have abandoned them, or they must have lost their self, whatever it might be. The Bible never promises us these things. And God is not concerned with your happiness. God is concerned with your holiness. There is a big difference, but I guarantee you that when you live a holy life, your life will be so full of joy that you can't be but happy. Because you're joyful. Because you understand who you are and who God is. Now, we're going to get to chapter 4 of Judges. That was all the introduction. In Judges chapter 4, again, Ehud had died and the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And God raised up Jabin, the king of Canaan, and Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. The people of Israel cried out for help because Jabin had oppressed them for 20 years and he had 900 chariots of iron. 900 chariots of iron. That is significant. If you have your Bibles, turn to Judges 119 and you'll see why it's significant that he mentions the iron chariots. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Chariots of iron were a, a was like the tank of the day. And Israel or Judah in their own strength were not able to drive out these chariots of iron. They had relied on themselves, and they were not able to do it. And so when these chariots of iron come up with, with Sisera... It's a, it's a reminder of their inability to drive them out. Yet God had promised that he would drive out the Canaanites if they obeyed, if the people of Israel obeyed him and they stopped relying on themselves. And so as we come to Judges 4, the iron chariots were a thorn in the side of the Israelites. The Israelites were outnumbered and they were out abilitied. They, they, they were no match physically for the people of Canaan, for the Canaanites that were led by Sisera. And so they were forced to call out to God. This is the place where you want to be in your life. You want to be in a place where you can't do it in your own strength because then you have to call out to God and then you aren't tempted to take the glory for yourself. This is where you want to be. 
It was my prayer when we launched the Chapel Calga Falls and as we transition into Falls Community Chapel that we would be a church that when people look at us from the outside, they say, I can't believe that church works. Because we don't follow the, the wisdom of the church growth experts. We are faithful to Scripture, and as we're faithful to Scripture, it is up to God to build His church. We will proclaim faithfully the word of the Lord. And He builds His church. He gets the glory. So the Israelites were outnumbered, they were out abilityed, and they were forced to call on God. And they soon learned that God was on their side. He had already promised that he would defeat the Canaanites. So Jabin and Sisera greatly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. And you can read about this in some of the oppression in chapter 5. Trade was not possible. The highways were unpassable because of the Canaanites. They were not safe. They couldn't travel on these roads. They, they were boxed in. They had no army. They had no way of defending themselves. They were defenseless. They couldn't protect themselves. Women were being taken and raped by the Canaanites. There was no safety there. And they were oppressed for 20 years. They couldn't protect themselves. Suffice it to say that Israel was greatly oppressed. Now hear this. God listens to and cares greatly about the oppressed. So the question that we ask ourselves is what are we doing for the oppressed in our culture? Are we part of the problem or are we part of the solution? Or are we simply waiting by and sitting there and waiting for somebody else to do it? As long as it doesn't impact us directly, we don't need to worry about it. This is one of the reasons why I am so excited about refuge host homes. That, that we, that Michael and Emily had this vision and desire to stand for people and to provide for and protect the vulnerable. Single pregnant mothers who need a place to stay, who need a family, who need somebody to stand up for them and be there for them. The vulnerable. Are there more vulnerable people in our society? This is one of the reasons why we did our food drive for Cuyahoga Falls City Schools last year and we're doing it again this year. FYI. We are doing a, a food drive for Cuyahoga Falls Schools so that people have food to eat over Christmas break. And so they collect food and they then distribute it to their students. So the students who eat breakfast, lunch, and sometimes dinner at school have something to eat. This is what we do. We stand for the oppressed and there is so much more that we can do. We want to be involved in helping and oppressing the or protecting the oppressed. Let me, let me start that sentence over again. In case we want to be involved in helping and protecting the oppressed because God cares deeply about them. And he has harsh words and he has harsh actions against those who are oppressing and who are allowing the oppression. And so it's here in verse 4 that we're introduced to Deborah. The people of Israel called out to the, cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess. A prophetess. Know that she is the first person to be called a prophet since Moses? Hear that. A woman is the first to be called a prophet since Moses. That's significant. Deborah was also a judge, and unlike the other judges of the book of Judges, she was actually a judge. She actually judged. People went to her with their issues, and she, because she was a prophetess, she had the wisdom of God, and she knew and understood Scripture that she was able to make decisions for the people. And so they went to her with their issues. But there's a connection here between the Israelites calling out to God 
and Deborah's judging. Because ultimately they go to Deborah seeking God's judgment. They cry out to God. And then they go to Deborah. They go to her seeking what's next. What's God going to do? What should we do? And so in verse 6, Deborah calls for Barak. Has not the Lord commanded you? Barak, the Israelites have been commanded to defeat the Canaanites. Know this. It's been years and years and generations and generations that God told us that he would defeat the Canaanites. He promised that we could overthrow them. He has commanded us and he has commanded you to go fight. So take 10,000 men, gather them on Mount Tabor, and I, the Lord, will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Now what's translated by the river Kishon is actually the valley. It's the valley of Kishon. And this is important because the valley of Kishon, and as much of the valleys are in Israel, during the dry season, it is dry. Maybe there's a little, a little creek that runs through it, but it is dry. During the rainy season, it is a river. So there, in this moment, they are in the dry season. There is no chance, logically, that in the dry season, there would be enough rain to do any damage. So they traveled through the, the valleys. That's where they were. That's where Jabin's army went. So you have the Israelites, they're on Mount Tabor, and down below in the, in the valley of the Kishon River is the Canaanites, led by Sisera. So Israel's looking down. Remember, these Israelites were aware of what God had done before. They may not have seen it firsthand, but they were aware that God did things for his people. Think of Jericho, what, what God did at Jericho, how they, they walked around the city and the walls fell down, or, or God parted the Jordan River for them to walk through. They were aware of what God had done through Joshua and also the previous judges. They knew the stories of God's faithfulness and how God would fight for them. But yet this is also Israel, when they disobeyed, they were defeated. So there is a direct correlation between their obedience to following God and their victories. When they disobeyed God, they were defeated. It is a 100% correlation. So Barak's response is puzzling, but yet it makes sense. Because look at verse 8. He says to Deborah, if you will go with me, I will do it. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. If you go with me, I'll go. If you do not go with me, I will not go. Barak is hesitant, to say the least. He doesn't want to go without Deborah. And in, in a sense, this makes sense because Deborah to him is a physical reminder of God's presence. Deborah, go with me. You're a prophetess. I want you to go with me. I need a reminder of God's presence with me. He wants some assurance of victory, and Deborah is that assurance. Because of his hesitancy, Deborah informs Barak in verse 9 that she will go with him, but he will not receive the glory of killing Sisera. The reader at this point assumes that it's Deborah who's going to do the work, who's going to have the glory of killing Sisera. And again, it's easy at this point to bash Barak. Isn't it? It's easy to say, come on, have some faith, would you? Like, God just spoke to you through a prophet. But yet we see in Hebrews 11.32 that he is listed as a man of great faith. Isn't that encouraging? That God sees our faith, and even though he knows that we struggle, he takes Barak and he says, he had faith. He's a man of great faith. Why? Because he, he obeyed. His faith may not be perfect. His faith may be weak. 
But he believed enough to go. He gathered the army to fight a much stronger army. And so in verse 11, we're introduced to a seemingly random person, Haber. Haber was a, a Kenite who was descended from Moses' father-in-law. He separated from the Kenites and became something of a nomad. He lived in a tent. And so know that the, the Kenites were allies of the Israelites. And this becomes important later. But just know that you have the Kenites over here. They're allies of the Israelites. Um, Tabor is over here. He has separated from the Kenites and he has become a nomad who lives in tents. What do you do when you're a nomad you live in tents? Well, you are used to taking up tents and then hammering them back down. Which, by the way, was the woman's job. It's important also later. Sisera learned that, Isra that Israelites had gathered for a fight, and so he gathered his men, his 900 chariots by the river in the valley. Deborah again speaks to Barak. So they're up here on this mountain, and the, the, the Canaanites are down here in the valley. And so Deborah speaks out to Barak. Go, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go before you? Notice the past tense here. It's as if God has already given them into his hand. This is the day that the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. It has been done. When the Lord makes a promise, it's as if it is already accomplished. It is so certain that it can be spoken of in past tense. And it says that the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. Now the author leaves out quite a bit of exactly what happened. Why would Sisera get down from his chariot and run away? Chariots were good in war. Why? Because they were easily defensed. They provided a very good defense for the people on the chariot. And they were a lot faster than people. But, but Sisera got down. Flip over to, to chapter 5, verse 4. And you'll see, The Lord went out from Seir. The earth trembled the heavens dropped, yes, the clouds dropped water. Now go to 521. The torrent Kishon, which is very different than a valley, the torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. The dry valley suddenly received a ton of rain and flash flood came through wiping out the army, making the chariots worthless. Have you ever tried to drive a chariot or a car or something through a ton of mud? It doesn't work. You get stuck. Horses can't pull chariots through mud, through water, through water-soaked land. And so God sent this, as, as the Israelites are up here, the the Canaanites are down here. God sends this rain. This flash flood comes, and it wipes the army out. And so Sisera is unable to take his chariot anywhere, so he gets off of his chariot, and he goes and he runs. The army at this point is worthless. And so the Israelites come out, and they kill all the men so that none of them is left except for Sisera because he ran. Sisera went to the tent of Jael, who is the wife of Heber. Remember? Remember Heber? He's the descendant of Moses' father-in-law, who became a nomad. He was a Kenite. Kenites had a treaty with Israel. Heber had made a treaty with Jabin. So Sisera found Heber, or Heber's wife, Jael, went into the tent and she acted as if she was protecting him. Hey, my Lord, come in. Here, here's some milk to drink. Here, let me cover you up to protect you so that people can't see you. And, and here, right, he's really thirsty. He just had a battle. His, his adrenaline was up and going, and he ran. 
He's tired. He falls asleep. And what does she do next? She goes and takes the, takes the tent peg and walks over, places it on his head, and hammers it into the ground. A woman killed Sisera. She took her abilities in hammering tent pegs, which she was good at because her husband was a nomad. Thus the word of the Lord through Deborah was fulfilled. A, a woman killed Sisera. Think of all the things that had to happen for these events to come to pass. God's sovereignty is over the even minute details of what we see on a day-to-day -day life. So on that day, verse 23, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And then eventually the Jabin was destroyed by the Israelites. And there's a lot of things that we could say about this passage because it speaks greatly of God's sovereignty. But I want to address something out of this passage that is important and often mis misunderstood. Again, when you, throughout the Bible, when you see Israel, when they act as the people of God, women are respected, they are treated well, they are treated as equals. Men and women in and throughout the Bible are equal. Men and women are both made in the image of God. You are all, we are all image bearers. And this is something misconstrued greatly throughout culture and our culture because there are divine roles that God has laid out for men and women. Equal does not mean identical. There is a difference between men and women that God created. He created us with different roles. He created us with different perspectives. He created us with different purposes. No matter how hard I try, or I can never carry a baby. And after seeing my wife carry four, I have no desire to carry a baby, I assure you. These are things that we cannot do. Men and women are different, and they are different in the Bible. But different does not mean unequal. We are both made in the image of God. We both have the Imago Dei. And it is when Israel becomes like their surrounding nations that women are then treated poorly and treated as second-class citizens. When Israel acts as they're supposed to act under divine command, women are exalted and they are equal with men. When Israel becomes like the world, men oppress women. It is what happens all the time in society. Biblically, there are a few things that are a man's role and only a man's role. And that is an Old Testament priest. Only a man could be an Old Testament priest. And in the New Testament, men are elders. God has laid that out. You have the priest and you have the elders. Other than that, other than these roles, women use their gifts, their abilities, their passions, all that they have to serve the church. Women, we value you. I hope you know that. I hope we, we do a good job as a church of using both men and women and our abilities collectively to, to put forth the kingdom of God, to proclaim the kingdom of God. I am grateful that we have women leading our singing, our teaching, teaching our kids, leading corporate prayer. These are just some of the visible ways that women give their gifts to this church. And I, I guarantee you that we could not do it without the collective wisdom that God has given us. I have three daughters, all of whom I am very, very proud of, and all who are strong in their own ways. I am blessed by each one of them. I'm excited to see how God will use them and the gifts that he has given them. I am so grateful to Melissa and for Melissa. 
those who know me and know me well claim that Melissa is a saint. And I would tend to agree with that. It's one of the benefits of being married to me. She has gotten sainthood. <laughs> and know that I would not be able to do my job without her. This is, God raised up Deborah to lead the nation, the nation of Israel. He gifted her and gave her the abilities that she needed to accomplish his work. Without Deborah, Barak would not have stepped up. It took her two times saying, Barak, do this, and then saying, Barak, would you go? Like, do you see what's happened? Go! Like, what are you waiting for? He would not have led. He would not have obeyed. As both men and women have the image of God, we are a team who works together in this church to expand the kingdom of God. And while our roles may be different by divine design, we are in this together, and I am grateful. One of the ways that this looks practically, we have a ministry leaders team that meets monthly, and it's men and women there together. Because I, I assure you, and you all are aware of this, if you have a bunch of men sitting together making decisions, we will not see a lot of things. It takes other perspectives, much in the same way if it was only women meeting together, you would miss a lot of things. It takes both of us together to do this. There is a role, and you will see that when we have elders, it is all men who are making those decisions. But know that it is not just the five of us sitting around pontificating about what guy things we should be thinking about and doing. Our wives will be there with us because they are part of who we are. Melissa knows my weaknesses and knows my faults better than anybody, and she knows when I can't see something that I need to be able to see. Now, that, that means that when the decision is actually made, it's just the five of us guys who have to make those decisions. But it is not without other input, because this is the role that God has given us. This is the, the way that he has worked this out. But know that men and women are made in the image of God and both are used by God to fulfill his purpose in the roles that he has given us and the roles that he has equipped us. And we see that in Deborah. She is just one example of many throughout history that God has used both men and women to build up his kingdom and build up his church. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website at thechapel.life.